The slave patrollers worked only at night, riding from plantation to plantation, stopping black people, searching their homes for contraband, and whipping any enslaved African caught traveling without a written pass. That was in 1704. By 1833, the slave patrols would be replaced by police officers. Black pain, no gain, being rounded up like sheep. Where's the justice? Where's the peace? No wonder Big Mama can't sleep. Crowds watching face to face. We're not scared of no mace. Been there centuries before, only saved by God's grace. Yes, we're still fighting, but we're also still dying. With our mothers still crying, with a system that's still lying. Black bodies in the ground surrounded by flowers and rivers of tears as another generation cowers. When will it be safe to come out again and not be afraid because of the color of our skin. We bleed and we wait because this can't be our fate. So we hope and we pray for that glorious day when we shall rise and come out from disguise to be worthy to be free. No longer, no longer hated, hated for taking, for taking a, knee. a knee. When we'll all be free. Let's just wait and see. Listen, America is raw right now, and her wounds are exposed. Uh, let's just go through a few of the names, the many names, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, La Laquan McDonald, Tamir Rice, Jordan Davis, the son of a member of Congress, Alton Sterling, Freddie Gray, Sean Reed, and we remember the countless others, um, including the black men and women who never had the, their killing captured by video and whose families have fought, fought, fought and shouted for justice and, and that they would be believed. And so we need to speak their names, we need to honor them all, and we need to act. And we have to speak truth about this moment. People are protesting because black people in America have been treated as less than human by history and today. People are protesting in America because our country has never fully addressed historical and systemic racism. And the people have a right to be heard. We must focus on why they are protesting. Why are they protesting? And I believe part of the problem is that we have two systems of justice in America and we need to make it a country that is true to its ideals where we say equal justice under the law. We need to have that mean something. People have to pretend that you're a bad person so they don't have to feel guilty about the things they did to you. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Michelle, and I wanna welcome you to another episode of Tab Talks. And my guest today is Julian Johnson. Hey, Julian. Hey, how are you, Dr. Mobley? Dr. Well, Pierce you... Mobley. <laughs> I know, and that's something. We go no, back no. a long way. No, we go back you... a long way. And when we I do. wanted to talk about policing, you were, the first, you were the first person I thought about. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I spent a good number of years doing that, working for the city of Cincinnati. Um, well, first I started off, it, it was a long road to it. So I, I didn't start off being police. <laughs> and I, I, I have another career too now, but yeah, that I, I spent a long time in policing. But Okay, well, I wanna thank you for coming on the show. And I guess before we get started, I, the obvious thing for me is why did you go into policing? And, and that's how the long road started. Well, my mom, who was a nurse, um, 
and she she kind of geared me because I didn't know what I wanted to do and I, she was like but you're going to school so I started in speech pathology and audiology and that's when I was at the University of Cincinnati and finished my degree in that started my master's in it and hated it uh, because they had me uh, dealing with people that didn't have speech impediments but really uh, dia dialectal things like um, people from India and stuff like that they had a different dialect they didn't have a speech impediment <laughs> so I didn't really, I didn't really like the program at the graduate level. And so I went back in education and I started, and then I started teaching school after that, after I went to graduate school for education. So I taught in the public school system for nine years and I would see the resource officers and things like that. And me being, and I've always had a servant's heart because I think my parents have too. We've always, they've always been community council presidents, uh, PTA presidents. We've always wanted to serve. Um, and my brother, who had a degree in criminal justice from Bowling Green, he was a police officer. And so I started looking more at that. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I think I can have my hand on the pulse more if I'm, if I, you know, and I can help more people. And just, and, and to tell you the truth, being in the classroom, sometimes I used to have to step outside. I needed some adult conversation. I used to be like, okay, I need, I need to talk to some grownups. So I am. Um, I went down and I said, you know, I think I'm going to go to the police academy. And, and that's how I, I got into going into law enforcement. Okay, so that's a good segue. We, you went to the police academy. Describe that for me. What are the educational requirements to get into the police academy? Obviously, you were master's prepared. Yeah, but the time you but, went. Yeah, but that, that's the, the requirement is a high school, high school diploma. You need to be um, 21 by the time I think of graduating from the academy. And you need to have a valid driver's license and a good, no criminal background, really. And so it's, you know. Wow. So the audience understands you could be a high school graduate and start mm -hmm. as long as you're 21 when you finish. Now, how long does it take to finish? Well, the, the particular academy that I went through and uh, the one here in Cincinnati is pretty extensive. Um, it was, uh, um, it was probably six months, maybe eight months of training. And you know you're 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 in the academy, and that's what you're doing every day. I mean, now they, they do pay you while you're in the academy. It's it's not a large large amount of money, but you get paid to to train. So, and that's what you do every day. Okay, so you've trained in the academy. Now, according to your bio, and I don't want to miss anything. You started in patrol. You were promoted to sergeant. Mm -hmm. uh, you've held supervisory roles, and then you ended your career in public service as a public information officer, which I think is pretty cool. So you've had a very successful career because you, you certainly had this upward trajectory just from beginning to end. So I guess that the million dollar question is, as you look at today's officers, do you think that they're, the recruits are receiving the appropriate training and preparation, or do you think that it's different now? I think that they are, I know here in Cincinnati, you know, and, and that's the perspective that I can speak from. We were a model for a lot of the cities around the country, especially after the civil unrest and we had the collaborative agreement. We became a model for a lot of the other departments around the city as far as community oriented policing and relationships with, you know, the citizens that we serve. So I think that here in Cincinnati, I think that, yeah, they are, they're actually probably having to even do more training because I think they're doing more with mental health these days, you know, because we, you know, as we're evolving, you know, policing, thank God, it's not where it should be, but it's not where it was either. And I think it's, you know, it's constantly evolving. And I think that we in Cincinnati have tried to be on the forefront of the evolution of things. Um, and, and we kind of, and I'm not going to say that we just knocked politely on the door and said, we need this. I mean, the door had to be kicked open and that happened, I think, in 2001 with the civil unrest. That, that, that took here with the uh, with the, the shooting of Timothy Thomas and killing that young man. Wow. So. Okay, so if we talk about the evolution of, of policing, uh, the buzzword that I remember was neighborhood policing, that we were told to anticipate or expect, at least where I live, that we would see officers walking to be riding bikes, uh, what happened to that? Would you say that that was successful or did you find that there were problems with that? You know what? I, I think it was very successful. And that is where I spent a large amount of my career. I was a, a community oriented or neighborhood supervisor, police officer supervisor. So I supervised the officers who 
were, they were called cop team, community oriented policing, neighborhood officers, very successful because we dealt with not just, um, I would say we, we didn't deal with just the symptom of the problem. We, we got in and we dealt with the whole, you know, we, we treated the whole problem because we dealt with quality of life issues. And a lot of times that's where stuff is coming from with people. You know, things just don't all of a sudden bubble up where, you know, you have two neighbors who get in a fight or something. There's something that's this systemic that happens here that, okay, so what caused that? What's going on? Okay, well, this dog, the, the neighbor's dog is barking every night at nine o'clock till two in the morning and I can't sleep. So all of a sudden I'm mad. So now I'm gonna go over here and confront, confront him, you know, so that there's a fight instead of, you know, so we would try to deal with, okay, so how can we work to solve the problems that are causing the, the bigger problems? Wow, I think that sounds pretty proactive. And that's, and that's what community-oriented policing was, it's proactive. It, it's, it's dealing with, with meet, meeting the community because uh, traditional policing was the police going in and telling the community what's good for them. With community-oriented policing, we're like, no, we're your partners. You live here. You tell us what you need, and we will try to work with you to, to get that done. Not coming in and telling them, look, this is your problem. This is how we're going to fix it. And that's what traditional policing, um, you know, had done. And a lot of people were like, hold up. That's not what we ask you for. So. Wow. Interesting. So policing effectiveness would have been impacted by those relationships with the neighbors because it requires you to call us. It requires you to inform us of what your needs are so that if there's a crime, everybody doesn't dummy up and nobody saw anything and nobody is aware of anything. And so you can't be as effective if people aren't aligned with you and partnering with you. Well, who do you tell your secrets to? You tell your secrets to people you trust. And if I'm just some officer who only shows up when there's a problem, or I need to arrest somebody in the community, that's the only time I show up, of course, I'm not going to talk to you. So with community-oriented policing, we became ingrained in the community. And, and that's what, that was the whole objective is you become a part of that community. You get to know the people. You know, you may not live there, which a lot of police officers, and historically, we were supposed to have to live in the city of Cincinnati, but you know, as the bargaining um, unit did did more, police officers started moving out to the suburbs and even being able to live in, you know, different cities. Like, uh, I mean, you know, so that took away a lot from people really knowing the community that they served. Whereas, you know, back in the day, somebody might even actually live in that same community. So with community-oriented policing, I mean, we had proactive things like, um, I mean, we would have uh, monthly meetings, of course, where the community would either come to the district or we would go out to the community meetings and make sure, you know, so we could hear their concerns. Uh, we had block parties, you know, we, we had interactive things with them. So they knew, you know, we had, you know, ice cream socials, you know, things that uh, we would grill out sometimes in the back of the district or either at one of the parks. So they knew and they, they could come and talk to us and they, they got to know more than just the uniform because, you know, of course, and, and you know, the, the, the historic nature of, especially the African-American community with the police. I mean, if you think about where policing started, I mean, let's, let's face it, they were quote unquote, uh, actually to go out to, 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 to catch the slaves yes. who escaped. So, yes. I mean, so that, that's a long history and it's not that long of why, why should we trust you? Wow, okay, powerful response. Now, nationally, we've seen good and bad examples of policing. Mm -hmm. And we now hear these public cries for defunding police departments, but I don't hear what we're replacing these police departments with. And I don't understand or support that type of communication or response. What say you about these cries uh, and who suffers if we defund the police? Okay, so if we take away police resources, we know, and you know, we, we know who, who the, most of the calls for police are in lower economic communities. They are communities that 
are uh, underserved in other areas a lot of times, a lot of times, and that's why they have problems that they have. So who do you think is going to suffer? It's going to be black and brown people and white people on the lower economic, you know, realm. <laughs> so that's, that's who's going to suffer the most. No, we don't need to defund the police. What we need to do is we need to make sure we educate more um, and we hold people accountable. So, I mean, defunding is, is not, you know, when you, take, when you take away police officers, you know, I know that the communities that I served for over 22 years, I mean, they, they mostly look like you and me. So there's, there's no way that I wanted to, no, 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 no don't get me wrong, you know, I, I, I served a, a big area where there were, you know, there were, there were white people too, um, but a lot of them, I mean, most of the calls came from... You, you don't you don't have the calls going to uh, mostly the rich suburbs. I mean, every now and then you might have somebody get drunk and you know somebody needs to take. Those aren't the calls that 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 we're getting. So, okay. Now we talk about diversity in the ranks, of police forces, because we wanted the officers to reflect the communities that they were serving. Mm -hmm. Do you think that diversity goals have been met? And if not, why not? We'll put it like this. When, when I got promoted to sergeant in 1998, let me tell you, it was, um, <laughs> it was, it was funny because the good old boys, they didn't know what to think of me. I was probably, when I got promoted, when I became a supervisor, I was probably only maybe the fifth black woman to ever be promoted in the history of the Cincinnati Police Department to be somebody's supervisor. And I never forget, you know, going into my first roll call and, you know, the guy's standing back there, arms crossed, like, you know. So, you know, I had, to, I had to get in there and let them know, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm your supervisor. And, you know, you will listen to what I have to tell you. Now, what I wasn't um, arrogant enough to, to, to put out there is that I was young. I was young when I got promoted. I mean, I was three years in. And a lot of people don't get promoted till. So there, there was there was a lot of policing because I had a lot of knowledge also on my shifts. So the guys knew I, it. I had SWAT guys on my on my shift. So if we had to go, and this was before the Matrix came out, to where SWAT would be called, or say we might have uh, somebody who fired shots or something, we had to go about something. I wasn't the arrogant supervisor to say we're just going to do this my way. I would meet with the guys. I would say here we would have a meeting point. Uh, all right, you guys are on SWAT. How do you all think we should go about doing this? Because everybody was about officer safety and trying to make sure everybody was going to go home that evening. So the guys respected that. And so I gained their respect by giving them that respect, but they knew that they needed to respect me as well. So, um, when I, when, <laughs> when I first, when I first got promoted, I would say that it was a, it was a tough road to home. Um, Thank goodness, though, um, we are seeing far more since and since I retired six years ago, I've seen a number of especially black women be promoted to different areas. Um, we had our first black command officer who was Kimberly Williams, and unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago from cancer. Um, but then and she and she was a she was one of my mentors when I came on um, and she was just a couple of years older than me. Um, we had uh, now we have a. Uh, Captain Danita Pettis, and I think Danita's probably going to end up being promoted to assistant chief, thank goodness, and she came in under me, and I, you know, and I told her, I said, go as high as you want to, as high as you, you know, want. so we have, we have, we do have some parity, um, it's not exactly reflective of, of the communities, but it's gotten, it's gotten so far that um, a couple of years ago, the federal consent decree that we had, um, the FOP kind of filed against, you know, wanting that rescinded because say if uh, on, a, on a test that was taken and you had, um, I don't know, say you had 20 candidates and the top three were white males. Well, for every white male that they had, you would have to reach back and grab a quote unquote protected class. So that was a black woman, white woman, or a black man. And so the parodies have, have gotten a lot better. So now 
the consent decree is no longer in effect. Um, like I said, it, it's it, it's not exactly reflective of the community, but it's way better than it used to be. And you see way more black officers uh, in supervisory positions than, than when I first started. Now we all know as kids, I know when you used to go to get the Halloween outfits, there used to be a lot of policemen out there. Do you, do you still feel that small children look at police the way that they did maybe when you and I were growing up? And you know, I, I would say, in, in the majority community, you still see little white boys. They always want to dress up as police officers. One of the things that I didn't like, Doc, when, when, I, would, when I would be out and, and, you know, I would, I would have a Black parent say to their kid, oh, I'm going to get the police officer to get you. Don't tell them that. Don't, don't tell them you're going to get me to get them. I'm, I'm here to help them. You know, if they're, if they're acting up or something, I would say, don't tell them that. I would maybe pull, can I talk to you? Let me pull up to the side and talk to them. But, you know, I mean, just, just think about it. I think it, it still goes back to relationships. And I would say across the board, we're seeing, you know, let's just face it. We're seeing a lot of folks who don't respect authority, period. So authority is being challenged everywhere. And so I would say that I still see it some, but not as much as it used to be. Um, and I mean, let's face it. It's got it's gotten tougher to, to be a police officer these days in this country. So now I know our former president talked about using different technologies. That was his response to police violence in terms of alternatives to deadly force. Do you see technology moving in that direction so that deadly force isn't necessary? And in my mind, I'm trying to think, what does that mean better? Body cam? Uh, what does well, that mean? Well, I would say it's body cams. And I've seen some really cool things. Um, the taser was was one of the things too also that really helped in not, you know, not using a firearm. But they they even came out with these things that look like something off of Batman <laughs> that I saw not too long ago that actually shoots out and wraps the wraps the person up, you know, instead of and I was like, you know, that I felt like Batman. <laughs> I felt like the Joker in Batman, like, where do you get these toys? You know, I had never used that. Um, the taser was the, the, the biggest thing in technology when I left uh, and retired uh, over six years ago now. But yeah, I think that they are working towards, uh, you know, let, let, let's face it, anytime police officers have to put their hands on somebody, not only do they risk hurting the person they have to put their hands on, but you, they also, there's risk to the police also, the police officer themselves, you know, off, they often get hurt in those encounters. So I think that um, with technology, I also think going back to, I said, there's becoming better training because a lot of the runs that we go on, you are dealing with people who have some type, are having some type of mental uh, breakdown or some type of mental problem, you know? And so uh, th those are a lot of the runs where I think that now, Police agencies, work, police agencies are working smarter with mental health professionals and they're becoming more educated in those things. And you have mental health professionals who are going out on runs too with police officers. Okay, I shared with you a, a chart and it was US uh, police shootings. Mm -hmm. And it denoted that blacks are disproportionately affected when you look at the percentage that we are in terms of the community. Yeah, when you actually look at the death percentages, it's it's very stark. It's very alarming. Yes. How did you feel and how do you feel as an African-American police officer, knowing what you were trained to do, knowing how you were trained to serve, yet seeing so many examples of things that I'm sure you guys have been trained not to do? Yeah. And yeah, and there and there have been some horrible examples of how people end up dead uh, at the hands of police officers that, that shouldn't have. I mean, you know, I mean, there, there, there have been a number of them here. I mean, the thing that kicked, kicked off the civil unrest here in 2001, Timothy Thomas should have never been shot. It was an accident that that officer tried to cover up then and that the administration tried to cover up then. And, you know, the city was sick of it. And that's, and that's when, you know, <laughs> that, that's when the, the jump off jumped off, right? And, that, and it should have. Um, I mean, it, it makes me feel horrible 
when I see anybody lose their life who shouldn't at the hands of police, and let alone a lot of times, once again, when you don't know people, all you've seen is what you see on TV. And that's a prime example of, of what happened here. The officer who shot Timothy Thomas in that alley, guess what? He came from a rural area. He'd never seen anybody who looked like us other than probably on TV. Ran And they, they, they put him down and over the Rhine uh, on night shift. And he was, he was afraid. He ran around with his gun in his hand all the time. And so when you see things like that, you know, a lot of times these guys are afraid. They don't, they don't know how to react. All they know is the bad stuff that they've seen. And that's how they react is with a gun. So yeah, it makes me feel horrible. Um, no, I could go through a list, just a list of people who have been killed by the, the police. And, you mm -hmm. know, there has been this slogan, say their name. And mm -hmm. we know that there have been numerous black citizens killed by police, but there are going to be those who say police kill white citizens as well. Not what would you same, say? Not at that? the same rate that black people are killed. I mean, just, just look at, <laughs> I mean, we can see with these mass shooters, a lot of them end up getting taken to Burger King and getting a, getting a malt before they even, uh, you know, and they're taken into custody with, uh, you know, no problem, you know, or either, I mean, there, there was a guy in Kentucky a couple weeks ago. He killed three police officers and a police dog. Now, uh, he got beat up, but guess what? He will live to tell the tale. He will live to see his day in court where you have wow. the young man, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so there are some, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say there's, there's some bad apples out there that should, should, should not be wearing the uniform. I mean, the young man that was shot and killed in Akron. There's no justification for shooting somebody 60 times. I know. I asked you. I, I was so distraught by that. I, I texted you. I was like, Julie, you mean they're saying that this is like protocol. Please yeah, tell me that's I, not protocol. I, I, but. I, I've never seen any protocol to shoot somebody, shoot somebody who's running away from me anyhow. We, we, we never were to shoot at people running away from us. Eight officers are now on paid administrative leave. Hopefully they'll get fired. And, 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 and you know, if, they, you know, you, they, if there's no justification that they should have shot this young man, somebody maybe needs to go to jail too. So you would be the person when there's an incident like that, that, you know, the reporters show up and you would have been the public information officer that has to respond to that. How would you even begin to prepare for something well, like that? As, as a PIO, when you show up on something like that and, you, you know, hopefully something that that's that crazy or, you know, that happened to, um, you know, um, a, a number of these high profile deaths and custodies, hopefully the chief is going to get himself out of bed or one of the assistant chiefs because the PIO, you know, what I'm supposed to do is deliver what happened, uh, the message from the police department. But a lot of times when stuff like that happens, the chief is coming out himself because, you know, because I wouldn't have known what to say. I, if that had been here in Cincinnati and, and a man had been shot and killed 60 times, I probably would have been calling him, oh, you need to come answer this one. I, I, I don't have anything for them on this one. Because if you, if you put, put me face. out, if you, if you put me out, <laughs> I'm not putting my face on this one. Exactly. They're going to be down at your office like tonight. So, yeah, I, I can't even, you know, when we, when we have instances where we have to use force that hurts somebody, it is our first duty to render aid. That man was still handcuffed when he got to the coroner's office. There was no aid rendered to him. And if they say it was, I'm like, how did you all render aid to him when he was still handcuffed? You're a lie. And how did you render aid to him when he had 60 holes in his body? What did y'all do? Um, you know, so there's some things that they're, they're not even explainable other than there was no excuse for that. There, there was no excuse for it. I, I can't think of anything protocol about that. And I, I, I challenge anybody, any other law enforcement person around the country, talk to me, tell me where that was protocol. If they don't like my answer, call me, tell me where that was protocol. 
So if someone, because I, I, I think that we need more people that look like us going into law enforcement. Should examples like that encourage us that we need more of us in law enforcement? Or do you think it's gonna have the opposite effect that we're like, I don't wanna be a part of any institution or any organization that allows that? Well, if we're not a part of something, how do we ever affect change? I mean, that, that would be my response. I mean, you can, you can stand on the outside and say, I want change, I want change. But if uh, the Sentinel Police Association had never come about with the city of Cincinnati, there wouldn't be any parity in our ranks right now. I mean, we had to kick the door in. We had to demand, we had to sue the police department for us to, you know, to, for us to get a fair shake at being promoted. So if we're standing on the outside and we know, we know that police officers, mostly police in areas where a lot of people look like us, why, why shouldn't we try to be part of the solution and part of the change? Be the change you wanna see. Well, you know, there's a global spotlight on police. Oh now. yeah. And what changes do you think need to happen? Just, just overall. Well, overall, and you know, I, I think that we, we saw a setback with the, with the previous administration too, because I think that there was a momentum that we were really going in the right direction for a lot of things. But then we had somebody in the White House who was like, knock them in the head and all the silly stuff that used to come out of his mouth. I mean, you, you can't have stuff like that coming from the top down and think that, you know, the people aren't going to fall into those things. Because like I said, the bad apples who are, the, who are around who don't have any regard they're going to run with that anyhow. So I, I think that it needs to always start. Well, I'll say it has to start at the top, but it also has to, that's why local elections um, are important. Uh, we just elected in last, the last sheriff that was elected here, uh, Charmaine McGuffey. She's a way different type of sheriff than we used to have here in Hamilton County. Um, you know, people don't, people aren't getting beat up at the justice center and stuff anymore. I mean, you know, just yeah. the crazy stuff that would go on that they would turn, turn and look the other way. I mean, we have to affect change, but we have to vote. We have to get out and vote on local elections. We have to demand change, but you can't demand change if nobody is holding office or nobody looks like us in those, in those areas. Cause a lot of times, you know, you're just a, you're just a clanging symbol. You're not, you're not there to help do that. So we have to get in positions to do those things. We have to demand education. We have to demand, um, you know, transparency. And we have to demand the partnership because those are the things that are going to make the difference. Well, you know, Julian, every time I have somebody on the show, I, I give them the last word. And what, what do you think is important? I just admire you. I, I've known you for many years. And I know well, you I admire you back. So there's a mutual admiration going on. <laughs> you know, you're a straight shooter. And I knew there would be no question I couldn't ask you. So I, I appreciate that. Well, you know, but, that's that's the way my folks raised me. I, I've never I've have never been a person to I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you anything that, that I don't believe from my heart and that you know I don't think is gonna work or I haven't tried. And if I don't know. I'm going to tell you, I don't know, but I'll, I'll try to find the answer for you. So so what do you want to leave our audience with? What takeaways? Well, I mean, I, I know that we are in some challenging times and I know that, um, you know, I, I, I know that there's definitely a distrust and there has been. I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't fall off a, a turnip truck yesterday. What, what I want to say to, to uh, your audience out there is we have seen some change happen. Um, the guys that shot and killed um, Ahmaud Arbery, who hunt, hunted him down there, down in Georgia. <laughs> I mean, going to jail. Uh, Chauvin, the other day, was just sentenced to 20 years in jail. Um, those things were not happening before. And I say, you know, we, we do have savvy people and, you know, when, when they see things, stand off to the side. If you have to videotape it, videotape it. Don't, don't interject. You know, you might let them know. 
you know, I, I don't, I don't think that that's right. But you know, you don't want to end up getting your phone taken or going to jail, especially if you have some a valuable piece of information. But I think the more that we engage in terms of telling people, look, we're here, we're not going anywhere. We expect you to treat our community the way you'd want your community to be treated, but it has to be a partnership and we have to inspect what we expect. So get involved in your community, you know, make the police be accountable in your community. And, and, and those are the things that I think you will see change. Thank you. You are a breath of fresh air. And I think that you've given some salient advice to everybody. Vote. It does come down to the local elections. It comes down to who you put in these key positions. You need to show up at City Hall. You need to have a relationship with your local law enforcement so that, Absolutely. you know, there's a, it's a partnership and they can't do it without us. So, you know, Julian, I want to thank you for coming on Tab Talks. You have been a wealth of information and I hope that we can invite you back. Absolutely. And hopefully we can get together other than on Tab Talks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you take it easy and thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do. All right. Have a good one. Unarmed Black people are three and a half times more likely to be shot by the police than an unarmed white person. In total, New York Police Department misconduct settlements cost the city $630 million between the fiscal years of 2011 and 2017. Civilians are indicted in 90% of killings. Police officers are indicted in fewer than 1% of killings. Where justice is denied and poverty enforced, where ignorance prevails and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons or property will be safe. Frederick Douglass.